evening, everyone. Bonsoir tout le monde. Um, if everyone could see their, take their seats, assis-toi uh, s'il vous plaît, um, that would be uh, great. We have a great evening prepared for you. Um, I want to thank uh, um, all of you for taking the time out of your, uh, your day, your evening, to spend uh, with us to, uh, to talk about uh, and, and learn about this very important issue uh, around uh, Lyme disease, its diagnosis and treatment in New Brunswick. Um, I want to uh, certainly thank Janet Higgins, the uh, president of Lyme NB. Janet, do you want to stand up? Lève-toi, s'il vous plaît. For all of her, uh, all of her work and for uh, really being the instigator of this, and she asked me if I would uh, host this as one of the leaders uh, uh, from the legislature and invite my colleagues. And so I did that and I'm very pleased that so many of my colleagues were able to attend uh, this evening. Dominic uh, Cardi, the Minister for Education and Early Childhood Education is here representing the Premier and, and himself, of course. Uh, so thank you very much, Minister Cardi. Uh, Minister Sherry Wilson, Minister of Service New Brunswick uh, is also here tonight with us uh, as is uh, the Attorney General and Minister of Justice uh, Andrea Anderson uh, Mason. Uh, thank you Andrea and Gary Crossman the MLA for uh, Hampton, lovely and beautiful Hampton is here tonight. Um, I'm, I'm going by party just because that's habit so it's not <laughs> the leader of the official opposition uh, Denny Landry. Uh, bienvenue Denny, merci beaucoup. And uh, the, my colleague from across the river, Stephen Horseman from Fredericton North is here, uh, which is great. Thank you, Stephen. And then uh, the leader of the People's Alliance, Chris Austin, is here. Thank you, Chris, for being here. And uh, his colleague, uh, the MLA for uh, Miramichi, Michelle Conroy. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, and uh, my caucus colleague, Megan Mitten, the MLA for Memorquoke Tantramar, is also here. Uh, so thanks, Megan, for, uh, for making the trip as well. Um, we, uh, well, I'll just say there's coffee around the corner for, there, there won't be a break, so you just get up when you feel like you need coffee and go around and get it. The bathrooms uh, keep going and turn right, and there they are for you. Uh, and uh, we are going to uh, get going. I've got uh, just a few introductory remarks to make. Donc, alors, bonsoir et bienvenue à la table ronde sur la maladie de Lyme au Nouveau-Brunswick. Le mois de mai est le mois de la sensibilisation à la maladie de Lyme et notre Premier ministre, comme vous le voyez à l'écran ici, l'a proclamé ainsi. Euh, il est donc très approprié que nous prenions l'occasion qui est devant nous pour euh, approfondir nos connaissances au sujet de cette maladie, ainsi que pour développer une plus grande appréciation de son importance pour les citoyens, les citoyens de notre province. To help us out this evening, we have with us three well-respected subject matter experts whom I will introduce to you shortly in turn. We also hear from three Lyme disease patients who are on a journey towards uh, restored health. And finally, we'll see what the recent survey of close to 100 New Brunswickers show us about the extent and impact Lyme disease has had on their lives. Um, we have quite a number of members of the medical profession uh, here tonight, and I'm not going to start listing them because I'm going to miss somebody, um, and, and other health professionals as well, and, and organi representing organizations too. Uh, but I do want to recognize our, uh, I'll recognize anyone with chief, anyone with chief in their name. So the, our chief medical officer of health, <laughs> Jennifer Russell, is here, and thank you, Dr. Russell, for. Uh, for joining us tonight as well. So if there's any other, anybody else with chief in your name, you stand up and I'll recognize you. How about that? Um, so, uh, but I do appreciate you all taking the time uh, tonight to join us. Um, so after each presentation, there'll be a short period of question and answers, really questions of clarifications, because it's quite short. And then following the presentation of our three experts uh, at the front here, we'll have a, a bit of a longer Q&A uh, period. Uh, and uh, then uh, we'll go to the uh, uh, patient's experience, the highlights from the survey, and then we'll wrap up uh, the evening uh, to see uh, where we might go from here. So you're not here to listen to me, um, sadly. That's usually what I'm speaking, what I'm hoping for, but uh, not tonight. So uh, uh, I'm, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker, speaker is Dr. Vet Lloyd. Uh, Dr. Lloyd is going to speak on ticks in New Brunswick and diseases they cause. 
Dr. Vet Lloyd is a professor of biology at Mount Allison University with expertise in molecular genetics and epigenetics. For the past several years, her lab has been working on the genetics of ticks and the pathogens they transmit, as well uh, as Lyme disease diagnostics uh, in humans and dogs. Dr. Lloyd runs the Mount Allison Tick Lab, which provides tick identification and pathogen testing to members of the public and veterinary medical community in the Maritimes. Her published work in this area includes tick genetics, tick behavior, and the use of dogs as a sentinel species to predict the risk of Lyme disease in humans. Dr. Lloyd is the co-founder of the Canadian Lyme Science Alliance, an organization that aims to unite scientists, clinicians, and patients in the quest for a more comprehensive understanding of Lyme bor borreliosis. Uh, so, please, uh, Dr. Lloyd, join us uh, on stage. Here. talking to a classroom of about 200 undergrads who would rather not hear me talk, so I'm actually used to a controlled bellow. Also, I'm too short to get up onto the podium. So does this work for everyone? Okay, good. And as an added bonus, you're probably not trying to pick up a date, um, and if you are, well, good for you. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm a biologist. I'm going to talk about the cause of this problem, which are the ticks and the bacteria they cover. You don't need to use a mic. For translation, you need to use a mic. Sorry. I need to use a mic. You need to use a mic. Okay. Um, but you can use this wireless one. You can use this wireless one if you'd rather Okay. Migrate. All right. Thank you. Okay. I will. Oh, well. I feel I should sing. <laughs> No, no, you're right, absolutely not. Okay, I promise to be quick. So I'm gonna start by talking about ticks, and there's a tick on the back of this very lovely bluebird here, which is why there's a bluebird. Um, so I'm talking about ticks, the bacteria they cause. Borrelia is the name of the bacteria that causes Lyme disease and its effect on humans. I'm gonna talk about ticks in New Brunswick, Borrelia in New Brunswick, and the Lyme disease risk. I'm gonna focus on animals because we have two MDs coming after me who can deal with the remaining species of interest, humans. Okay, so we have to worry about uh, ticks and ticks are promoted, the number of ticks they feed, they drink blood from animals, uh, one of the animals that really drives large increases in tick populations are deer. We also have the bacteria that causes it, this uh, little squiggle here, almost invisible. And what drives the number of bacteria are mice. So we have a very complex problem, and it gets more complex when we introduce uh, us. Um, and because some of the ticks that get infected because the mice are harboring the bacteria end up on us, they also end up on our pets and agricultural animals. But we're mostly concerned about with people here. Okay, and what we want to avoid is getting into a situation like this. This was a picture sent to me by a mother from Lunenburg in Nova Scotia, which is a hyperendemic region from ticks. And the subject line of that email was, is this a problem? and I would be inclined to say yes. We want to stop the problem, we want to deal with the problem before we get to that point. Okay, so we have ticks here, and they're big, they're ugly. If people wanna see a real live tick, I was just given one, so that's fantastic. Briefly, the biology here is they're hanging out on shrubs and grass, waiting for you to go by. They grab you with their front legs. They crawl around your body. You don't feel them because they crawl so slowly. They squirt in an anesthetic so you don't feel them, feel them biting you. They plunge their mouth parts, which is like a harpoon, into your bloodstream, into your skin. Then they suck your blood. Your blood is mostly water. I do hope everyone here at this point has eaten um, because they splosh the blood around. Your blood's water. They don't want the water. Instead of peeing it out on your skin, they squirt it back into your bloodstream. 
Isn't that delightful? As I said, I hope everyone's had enjoyed their dinner. Eventually, they engorge and drop off and move on. Okay, so that's the basics. Your biology lesson is over, you can relax. So for ticks in New Brunswick, we have ticks coming from two sources. One is adventitious ticks, which is basically ticks from away. These are ticks that come in on migratory animals, like birds. That's a rather nice little sparrow there. Um, and because these animals are often coming from hyperendemic regions, they're introducing infected ticks and ticks that have a very high chance of being infected. We also have our own local homegrown ticks. This is an old map which shows that there were a initially a fairly small number of endemic regions, areas with self-sustaining tick populations. Those have spread across the province. So, um, the way we map ticks is uh, people in the public, in the veterinary community particularly, are very supportive. They send us ticks they get, we put them on a map, little dots. Uh, this is an animation that's not going to animate. Uh, if you saw, if it did animate, this was uh, very kindly produced by Service New Brunswick, but and will be posted on the site soon. You see these red dots from 2012, and as time goes on, the red spreads further northwards and up the coast and on the peninsula here. So that's what's been happening in the past. Hmm. Okay, so what's happening in the future? You can use this data to make predictions. This is a prediction of the parts of New Brunswick that are currently suitable to maintain stable tick populations. Uh, so it's basically the southern third, which unfortunately is also where most New Brunswickers live, and then up the coast. So that actually covers most of the New Brunswick population. As time progresses, this is 2050, uh, most of the province is completely suitable for ticks, and 2080, um, we could summarize that by saying we're screwed. <laughs> okay, um, in addition to the black leg tick that I've been talking about, we have the American dog tick that uh, slowly has been spreading through Nova Scotia. It's now established in New Brunswick in certain sites and we're following it as it increases through the province. That's very exciting for us, probably not for anyone else. We're watching ticks have sex with each other, which isn't quite as pornographic as it sounds. Uh, we're looking at hybrids where they can share both pathogens and the genetic traits that make them hardier. And we're also looking at uh, the Lone Star tick, the one that causes meat allergies, that's being introduced sporadically on dogs and birds, um, but it seems to be able to establish in the province. Okay, why this matters, why all the ticks matter, is because different spe tick species transmit different pathogens. However, the one we're going to worry about is Lyme disease. Okay, so the Lyme disease bacteria, this is a slide full of them, all these little squiggly shapes, they are supposed to look like a beautiful corkscrew, but they can look like anything they want because they basically do whatever they want. Oops, going back here. So just like every other living organism, they come in different varieties. They're called species. So in the United States, we, it's well known that there are different species. They tend to be collected in certain geographic areas, even though they are globalizing because people keep moving around. Um, so we've been worrying about what happens in Canada and particularly in New Brunswick. So in monitoring the ticks here, in addition to Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the standard Lyme bacteria, we have a relapsing fever bacteria called Borrelia miyamotoi. This has, was documented 2012 by the Public Health Agency of Canada. That's increased quite a bit in the last few years. So that's expanding rapidly. It's now throughout New Brunswick. Uh, we're also finding Borrelia bassetti, which is dispersed through New Brunswick, although less frequent. And we're particularly worried about the European strains of Lyme disease uh, that's been documented in Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. Uh, there's a recent documentation of it uh, in an island off Grand Manan that, depending on who you listen to, is either part of New Brunswick or the state of Maine. Uh, the main CDC has picked that up. So we are starting to see more strains of Lyme. The implications of this is for diagnosis, the standard uh, Lyme blood test 
may not pick up, well, in some cases will not pick up these other species of Lyme disease. Okay, in terms of risk, it's not just an issue for humans. This is the last you're going to hear about anything that isn't a human, so that's my dog um, who unfortunately died of Lyme disease. But uh, So it's a risk of Lyme disease throughout the province. Uh, the darker the color, the worse the risk. Uh, it's a problem for horses. Uh, really an enormous number of horses throughout the province are seropositive for Borrelia, although if you think about the fact that they stand out in fields, that's to be expected. The same is true of cows. Uh, in highly endemic areas, almost all of them are seropositive. It's slightly better in less endemic areas of New Brunswick. Um, and for those people who are worrying about porcupine health and Lyme disease, I'm sure you all are, um, it's an issue with a number of wildlife species in the province, which is perhaps not surprising. Okay, so to summarize, we live in an absolutely beautiful part of the world. We're very privileged to live here. There are gorgeous trees, there are gorgeous places to be outside, and we have to be out there, we have to be out there enjoying it. But we do have to be aware of the risks and be sensible about it and appreciate the complexity of nature. So a subject summary is that both the ticks and their pathogens are spreading in New Brunswick. We're getting some new tick species establishing. We've got new Borrelia species that are already present and would, may well be expanding. Um, for the future, uh, later on, I've, I was very proud to partner with Lyme NB to look at the social implications of Lyme disease in the province. Something we also need to really worry about are new diagnostics that can pick up the full complexity of the disease as well as monitoring treatment outcomes. That gives me a beautiful segue to our next speakers. So thank you very much. But I can't escape yet. No, you can't escape. So five, five minutes um, of questions for uh, Dr. Lloyd, if there are questions. Or... You don't want to do all three speakers together. No, we're going to do like questions of clarification, things you didn't understand. Do you, like, do you like microphones, Jackie? Um, I'm on a microphone now, too. That's great. I just wanted a question on clarification of the tick species and transmission of Borrelia. Yep. Um, quickly, in terms of what tick species you think are actually transmitting Borrelia burgdorferi in New Brunswick. Uh, so having Borrelia is a different question than transmitting it. So the, di the literature is very clear that the black-legged ticks, which at this point, we're still seeing from ticks from humans, the 97% of them are the black-legged ticks. For the other species, transmission is not shown. There are a few case reports of Exodus cookii, the groundhog tick, transmitting, but I don't think it's... They're more of them on people than you would expect to see if they were a major... There's less disease than you'd expect if they were a major transmitter of Lyme disease. So I think it's still very much a black-legged tick story. Yeah, no, I'd agree. Great. And I also found I just a comment, too, in your Borrelia myomot, I found, um, intriguingly, like the National Microbiology Laboratory has been following that across Canada, too. But you made a, a comment about you saw, like, double the amount of infections with Borrelia, which is, um, if you could clarify that, no, too. So, they, they found from data that was taken 2009 uh, to 2012, they found 1% across Canada, and now we're finding a higher percent in New Brunswick, but that is six years later. So all I'm saying is that the, the oh. incidence is increasing as time passes. Yeah, I misunderstood. I thought we were talking about <coughs> tick infected with both Miyamoto and Borelli, and that number had been high. So I misunderstood, so thanks for the clarification. Yeah. There, you do see co-infections, uh, and you do see them slightly greater than you'd expect by chance, but I, that number was just the number of Miyamoto yeah. infections in ticks. No, which fits in with what they're seeing nationally, too. The intriguing thing is how that actually plays clinically, too. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions of clarification? I noticed on the maps, uh, it seems to be going up the north via the east coast, not the west coast of New Brunswick. Do you yeah. have any explanation as to why? Water. Um, it is water driven. So a lot of the 
uh, introduced ticks are coming in on birds they track up the coast, whether they're seabirds or land birds that just track up the coast. So they're, that they're seeding the coast with ticks. And the other consideration is, the, notwithstanding the weather in Sackville right now, uh, it, the coasts are usually quite a bit milder, so it's a nice area for ticks to live. You go up to Woodstock, it can get, the winters can still be pretty hard. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lloyd. Now, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Duncan Webster. Uh, Dr. Webster is going to be talking, well, the title of his talk is Vector Distribution and the Public Health Challenges of a Changing Climate. Dr. Webster received his medical degree from Dalhousie University and subsequently completed his internal medicine residency training uh, and training in an, uh, and an infectious diseases fellowship at the University of Alberta. Following this, he returned to the Maritimes where he completed further fellowship training in medical microbiology at Dalhousie. He has worked as an infectious diseases consultant and medical microbiologist in his hometown of St. John since 2007. Dr. Webster also holds a master's in philosophy from UNB. Good job. Um, and <laughs> can't be easy compared to medical school. Jeez. Uh, just saying. Uh, anyway, uh, can you please welcome uh, uh, Dr. Webster uh, to the podium. All right, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, hello, bonjour, quoi. It's uh, it's a real honor to be here tonight to speak uh, at the Green Party Caucus Roundtable on Lyme Disease. I think this is a really important subject matter, so I'm very thankful to have the opportunity to speak. So thank you to the organizers. So I'm going to speak on uh, vector distribution and the public health implications of a changing climate. So we all have a very deep and intimate connection with the land that we live on. So I need to begin by respectfully acknowledging that I live and work on the unsurrendered and unceded territory of the traditional lands of the Willistiqua. And the, Willis the Willistiqua people have uh, lived along the beautiful river for millennia. The beautiful river is also known as the Willistook and the St. John River. My family have lived at the southern edges of the, of the Willistook watershed for 236 years. So I feel a very deep and intimate connection with this land. I want to tell you very quickly about a few people that I've met along my journey and just to highlight some of the reasons why we're here tonight. So firstly, I want to introduce a 40-year-old woman who lives in Milledgeville. She was previously healthy and developed this evolving bullseye rash on her flank. It uh, quickly spread and was diagnosed with uh, Lyme disease, treated with 14 days of doxycycline, and did very well. Another woman who I met was a 45-year-old woman. She lived on the west side of St. John. And she presented to hospital one day during the month of August, and she had a facial droop. She also had a bad headache and a stiff neck. She was admitted to hospital and she underwent investigations. The investigations included a lumbar puncture and the spinal fluid analysis showed evidence of Lyme meningitis. So she was treated with 14 days of intravenous ceftriaxone and within a few days, her facial droop had resolved. She also went on to do very well. Third individual, He's a 73-year-old man. He was previously leave, living independently. And he was admitted to hospital with fever, confusion, uncoordinated movements. With a diagnosis of encephalitis, he was started on ceftriaxone, ampicillin, acyclovir, which we pretty standard treatments. And he did not respond very well. 
We were able to abstain, obtain further information from his family, and exposures included frequent excursions into the woods in Grand Manan. So we, based on some of this additional information, ordered additional serological tests and diagnostics. We added doxycycline to his regimen. Unfortunately, this man did not have a meaningful recovery. So there's a few people that I wanted to, to share with you. Now, I mentioned that I've grown up in New Brunswick. My family's been here a long time. So this is Milledgeville. This is where I grew up and now work. And I can tell you, when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, there's not much that you can see in this picture that my feet didn't touch. We were all over the place. And that's what kids do, and that's good. But I'll tell you, we never saw these. We never saw, saw ticks. I wouldn't have been able to tell you what a tick was. Very different today. So let's back up. What, what, what happened? So in 1977, in Connecticut, there was a group of children who were diagnosed with what, what was felt to be juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And as time went on, it was recognized that, in fact, these children actually had an infection. And flash forward years later, when Borrelia burgdorferi was identified, and it was realized that these children had Lyme disease. And the term Lyme disease was coined because this, these children were from Lyme, Lyme Connecticut. So 22 years later, on the southeastern shore of Nova Scotia, a migratory bird was identified in 1999, and it was carrying a, a tick. It was identified as a black-legged tick, and this tick was subsequently found to be carrying the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi. This was the first infected tick identified in Atlantic Canada. So flash forward further to 2008, back to Milledgeville. So it was identified at that time that there had been a sudden and sharp rise in cases of Lyme disease. So surveillance had been done, an issue was identified, and so there was a response. And that response from Public Health Agency of Canada was to bring down a number of field experts and in collaboration with the, the provincial public health. And I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to take part. So we did drag sampling, and in one morning, we identified well over 100 ticks very easily. And when we went to the lab with these ticks, it was found that 20% of the nymphs were in fact positive for Borrelia burgdorferi. So that is the background for Milledgeville being declared an endemic region for Lyme disease. It met criteria. So what, what happened here? What, so what we're seeing is an evolving vector distribution. So a vector in infectious diseases, a vector is an animal or, or some sort of vehicle that carries an infectious pathogen that is subsequently transmitted. So in this case, the tick is the vector. The tick carries the bacteria, and just as Dr. Lloyd has explained, it passes on that bacteria to another host, oftentimes humans. So the tick is the vector, and that's what a vector is. So what's happened here? So what's happened is if you go back into the 20th century, there was reforestation of a lot of farmland. And in doing that, the range, the natural range and habitat for the black-legged tick expanded. So in the 1970s, we saw Lyme disease evolving in, uh, in uh, southern New England. And now we're seeing Lyme disease emerging in Canada. It is currently the most common vector-borne disease in the United States, and this is an issue of climate change. So in addition to it being the most common vector-borne disease in the U.S., since Lyme disease became nationally notifiable in 2009, we have seen a sharp increase in, I see a yellow card, I don't know what it means. <laughs> Two minutes left? Holy smokes, okay, I'm gonna run through this. <laughs> So it's increased uh, uh, astronomically. So we've seen a large spike in, uh, in human cases. And so this is about surveillance. And surveillance is a means of gathering data and looking for patterns. We've seen patterns in terms of rise in human cases. We've seen patterns in terms of uh, infected ticks. And we're seeing a northward spread even through our own province, just as Dr. Lloyd has shown. 
Now those, the surveillance cases are not synonymous with clinical cases, so I need to make that point. But I do, because of limited time, I am just going to fast forward here a little bit further, because what I really want to talk about is the background behind all of this. Why are we seeing this trend? Why is the vector distribution taking place? It's because of CO2. We're seeing rises in CO2, and when we see rises in CO2, we see rises in temperature, and this leads to a number of issues related to our health. In addition to rising sea levels and increasing extreme weather events, we're seeing other illness patterns that lead to changes in vector distribution and ecology. So I'm sure my pointer is not working, but we're seeing changes in, in diseases such as chikungunya, dengue fever, malaria, hantavirus, and also Lyme disease. And this is widely recognized. CO2 in our atmosphere today is higher than it has ever been at any point that humans have lived on this planet. And the Scripps Oceanography uh, Oceanographic Institute in Hawaii just a week and a half ago tweeted out that we are now seeing over 415 parts per million of CO2 in our atmosphere. So that's an issue. You guys may recognize this graph at the bottom, which is the Keeling graph that shows the rising trends in CO2 dating back to the 1950s. If you go back farther and look at geological time scales, CO2 and temperature have not always had perfect concordance. But if you move out to the very end, into the epoch where we are now, and you look back just over the past 350,000 years, CO2 levels match very well with temperature. And you can see the blue on the end moving skyrocketing up over to 400, now 415 parts per million of CO2 in our atmosphere as we sit here today. And the expectation is that we'll continue to see temperatures rise. This is a major issue. In 2015, it was stated that 14 of the 15 hottest years on record had occurred since 2001. So what's happened since then? Well, you can add 2016, you can add 2017, and you can add 2018 to the hottest years on record. So as an infectious diseases physician, that's a concern to me because we're seeing changes in a number of vector-borne diseases across the globe. We can talk about uh, Chagas disease, which used to be only seen in South America and Central America, and it's now moving up into North America. Or we can talk about Lyme disease, which was an issue in New England, and we're now seeing it in New Scotland. Things are changing, and this is an issue of climate change. So what can we do about this? What, what sort of action can we take? So there's a few things. First of all, on an individual basis, I think we need to look at in many individuals within our province who are struggling with very complex disease. Lyme disease and vector-borne disease and associated illness requires a change and a different approach than our current medical system is offering. Our current medical system works very well for many diseases, but there are ways that we can improve this. Invicta Health is looking at a community-based model of care for complex chronic disease. I think this is one of the solutions. Education and prevention are also obviously very critical. So just a final slide, uh, sorry, two slides. From a global perspective, we need to be aware of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and I'm happy to talk more about this. This is a plan for our future. As a global community, we have in the past and we can now make substantial change if we work together. There needs to be a call to action. There is a call to action. And from a global perspective and with regards to climate action, we need to drastically cut carbon emissions. We need to look at reforestation. We need to create carbon sinks and technologies for carbon capture. We need to be innovative. We need rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Webster, and uh, now we'll take uh, some questions. Michelle. <clears throat> I just noticed, um, God, I don't like my voice there, um, the symptoms for Lyme disease kind of the same as Gillian Bray's. Have they ever been misdiagnosed one for the other, or? Yeah, there, there's a number of different illnesses that can, if you take just the, the symptomatology of Lyme disease, there's a number of different infections that can look that way. And in fact, that's why I put up that third case. That third case was not Lyme disease. There were clinical symptoms consistent with it. There were uh, exposure histories of concern. But ultimately, the serological testing and the further diagnostics showed that what that individual actually had 
was a California serogroup encephalitis. It's a mosquito-borne virus that we see locally. So there are a number of different illnesses that can very much look like Lyme disease, and that's why these complex chronic disease clinics, I think they can be very helpful. How do you diagnose it? Is it just blood work for Lyme disease? So not necessarily. There, is a cl there are clinical manifestations. And as an example, in that very first case that I showed, that woman did not have any blood work done. It was a clinical diagnosis. She was diagnosed and she met uh, diagnostic classification for Lyme disease. She was treated. But oftentimes we do require blood work and typically uh, uh, serology is used. Uh, other times we don't need it. Uh, another good example, individuals with Lyme arthritis. So if you tap the fluid in the knee, you can do molecular testing on that to look for Lyme disease. That's diagnostic. So you don't always need to do blood work, but it's often important in the, in the diagnostics. And if the um, treatment for Lyme disease, is it like a two-week treatment? You said in these, each of those ones it was two weeks. Um, is it, does that cure it or is it just a treatment? Like is, is Lyme disease a, uh, an ongoing thing? Would they need longer treatment? Yeah, great, treatment. great question. So generally speaking, two weeks of treatment is, is required, depending on the manifestations and, and the type. You know, are we talking about meningitis? Are we talking about Lyme arthritis, et cetera? You may require four weeks of treatment. Generally, that's all that's going to be required. There have been five randomized controlled trials looking to see if extended courses of antibiotics are, are of any benefit. And those are the highest standard of, of uh, scientific research from a clinical perspective. So those are very, very good studies, and they've shown that prolonged treatments were of no benefit. So you know, that's, I think, I I important to look at. About 10 to 15 percent of people, when they have Lyme disease, continue to have some degree of, I'll say, unwellness after their treatment. Uh, so you may have ongoing symptoms afterwards, which is not uncommon uh, with other infectious diseases as well. And is it one of those, if it's misdiagnosed or you don't get it right away, the chances of it lasting longer? Um... Well, it's going to last longer because you haven't been treated. Mm -hmm. But once treated, you'll be able to, to treat the infection. The same amount of time. It doesn't affect the, the time. Like, if, yeah. you don't, if you don't get it, you know what I mean, in the same, in the, like Guillain-Barre and those kind of diseases, if you don't get it right away, then the chances of, of not being, like, you know, of, of getting cured from it. Yeah, so, th again, the, the studies show that with four weeks of treatment and then extending out longer, you're not going to get further benefits from treatment. Okay. You may have more residual sequelae. So what I mean by that is, let's say, for example, that you've had meningitis, or let's say you've ended up with serious arthritis in your knee. You've got damage to that knee. So you can treat the infection, you can kill the organism, but now you've got damage in your knee. If you had to treat it earlier on, you would not have sustained the same amount of damage. Yeah, that's awesome. So the earlier you get treated would be of benefit. And that's, again, that's true for, for most infections. I think I've got time for one more question. We're good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Webster. I must say, our speakers are keeping right on time, which is fantastic. <laughs> uh, our next speaker uh, is Dr. Ralph Hawkins. And he's going to speak on perspectives on Lyme disease from an Alberta practice. And Dr. Hawkins has traveled here uh, to be with us from Alberta. Dr. Ralph Hawk Hawkins received his medical degree from the University of Saskatchewan and went on to complete fellowships in internal medicine and nephrology at the University of Calgary. Dr. Hawkins also holds a Master's of Law uh, degree from the University of Northumbria at Newcastle. Philosophy, law, physicians, it's amazing what these guys do. Um, in their spare time, I guess. Dr. Hawkins has a special interest in the diagnosis and clinical management of Lyme disease, tick-associated polyorganic syndrome, chronic Lyme disease, and post-treatment Lyme syndrome. His outpatient practice in Calgary has evaluated over 250 people from all parts of Canada diagnosed with Lyme disease. In 2016, Dr. Hawkins received the University of Calgary Department of Medicine Award for Clinical Excellence. He is a clinical associate professor of medicine with the Division of General Internal Medicine at the Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary. Please join me welcoming Dr. Ralph Hawkins.
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, I think this, uh, this uh, meeting is unprecedented, and I really want to extend my appreciation to the organizers for putting it together, to have public health people, physicians, legislators, and patients all in the same room on the same page is really quite unprecedented, so thank you. Um, I also think that the presentations could be a minute or two longer if we dispensed with those lengthy introductions, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk about Lyme disease from a perspective of a doctor who treats Lyme disease in a province that isn't declared to be endemic for Lyme disease. Um, my disclosures are shown here. I do have some relationships with industry and I do uh, speaking and consulting with industry, but more importantly, uh, the Code of Ethics of the Canadian Medical Association obliges me to say whenever I speak to a public, uh, lay public audience, that the uh, opinions that I hold are not the opinions of the general profession and that what I'm talking to you about are probably departures from what you would hear from most physicians. And I think it's ethically responsible for you to know that. So Lyme disease from my perspective goes as follows. There are problems with clinical diagnosis. There are problems with laboratory diagnosis. There are problems with epidemiologic surveillance. There are problems with management of patients with chronic persistent symptoms. And if you live in a jurisdiction that has an evolving, growing population of Borrelia-infected ticks, this should scare you. So let's talk about diagnosis. These are the guidelines uh, as of 2009 for the diagnosis of Lyme disease. They've changed a bit in 2016, but the point that I'd like to make remains pretty much the same. Confirmed cases of Lyme disease and probable cases of Lyme disease rely heavily on laboratory support and laboratory diagnosis. The one exception is the probable case definition of clinician-observed erythema migrans rash which allows a diagnosis without laboratory evidence if you have a history of residency in or travel to an endemic area. And this is specifically the, the case that uh, Dr. Webster alluded to earlier. The laboratory testing is what I'm going to focus on. And the laboratory testing involves a two-tier test approach. The two tiers of the two-tier system, we'll see if the, yeah, the pointer really doesn't work, does it? Darn, I have one up in my room. Um, the two-tier test system is as follows. The first tier of the test is an immune enzyme, uh, an enzyme immunoassay. Um, we use something called the C6 test now in Alberta. There's new ones called the VLSE. But these are sensitive tests that identify antigens that, um, that are um, specific for the Borrelia organism. If the test is positive or equivocal, then a second test needs to be done. The second test is called a Western blot test, which identifies specific um, antibody antigen pairs by their molecular weight and separates them according to what we call bands. Uh, if the test is negative, we're instructed to consider alternative diagnoses, or if this is a new presentation of a new patient, consider retesting them after a period of time. So this is the sensitivity of the first tier testing. The C6 test from the product monograph of the test itself identifies that in the first one to two months, the test has a sensitivity of 78%. That means that if you truly have the disease, you have a 78% likelihood of the test being positive. So 22% of people who are truly sick will get a negative test result if their test is done in the first one to two months. The C6 product monograph explicitly says and directs that the test should not be used to exclude the diagnosis of Lyme disease if it's negative. The second test, the Western blot tests, are either IgM tests or IgG tests. The IgM tests are in the top part of this panel and the sensitivity is surrounded by the blue box. You'll see that within the first month, this test is sensitive 49% of the time. In month one to two, it's about 89% sensitive. And after the second month, the sensitivity of the IgM starts to fade. 
The IgG test is the lower panel. The sensitivity is identified with the red box. In the first month, the IgG is sensitive about 27% of the time. At uh, month one and two, it's about 52% sensitive. As you go along, the sensitivity improves for the first year, but after the first year, the sensitivity of the IgG test begins to fade. So here are 100 theoretical people who have early Lyme borreliosis. They have an erythema migrans, and in spite of the fact that they have erythema migrans, and that is diagnostic in itself, they're being subjected to laboratory testing for Lyme disease. Well, only 64% of patients with acute erythema migrans are going to have a positive C6 test. So only 64% will have their blood sent for the second confirmatory test. And when that second confirmatory test is done, if it's done within the first one to two months, 52% of them, or 33 people from that 100 cohort that you started with, would have positive two-tier testing. The two-tier testing doesn't work well in the acute situation, and the product monograph for the, I, for the IgG Western blot explicitly says that the IgG test should not exclude the possibility of an infection with Borrelia if it is negative. So the two-tier testing methodology that directs away from a diagnosis of Lyme disease is actually running counter to the explicit information that's in the product monographs of the C6 test and the product monograph of the IgG Western blot that direct that that should not happen. So is the testing accurate for Lyme disease? Well, there's acceptance. This is a slide that's frequently shown at, uh, at meetings, uh, frequently shown by infectious diseases doctors at meetings, and it identifies the poor test results for acute stage uh, Lyme disease and convalescent Lyme disease. The red box outlines the so-called two-tier test with an initial enzyme immunoassay and then the IgG Western blot. But in later disease, it reflects an 85% sensitivity for stage 2 and a 100% sensitivity for stage 3 disease. So think about that in the context of the data I just showed you. The 100 people with late Lyme borreliosis now, people with late Lyme disease being tested with serology, we know that the C6 test has a stated sensitivity of 98%. So we drop two people because the C6 is falsely negative. And then the IgG Western blot is only 81% sensitive after the first year. So mathematically, this shows that you cannot have a two-tier test that is more than 79% sensitive in late Lyme disease. So where did that 100% come from in this study? Well, the study was published. You'll see the journal reference at the bottom from the uh, Clinical Infectious Diseases in 2008. And it's this article, a prospective study of serologic tests for Lyme disease. And the way that they picked their late Lyme disease patients to include in that analysis was they looked at 147 people who had late Lyme disease who had objective clinical findings and positive serology. So you select people who have positive serology and then you see if their tests are positive. <laughs> and then you report that it's 100% sensitive. That's called a selection bias, and it's a scientific and logical fallacy. Testing is not accurate in late Lyme disease, but we have chronic Lyme patients showing clear evidence of signal of uh, Borrelia exposure. So what about the specialty labs? Well, the Health agencies identify that the specialty labs uh, disparage, are disparaged, that we should avoid relying on the specialty labs. And it's because of this study that was published by Fallon in 2014, I believe. And he identified that when this testing methodology, the Western blot studies were looked at with a specialty lab, looking way over on the right-hand side in the red box there, you'll see that in normal people, 57.5% had positive test results. So that is a failure of specificity of that test. So that's the in-house reporting of the, that specific specialty lab. And on the basis of that, this study shows that we shouldn't rely on that reporting. 
But the, the same study identifies, can someone get me a glass of water, just pop it up here, please? Same study identifies that the C6 test showed perfect specificity in this population. Zero patients who were normal had, posi had uh, positive test results. And if we go on to look at the sensitivity in this particular study, the sensitivity of the C6 was in the mid-60% range, and that was well above the two-tier testing. And interestingly, when we look at the Western blot studies done by the University Reference Lab and compare it to the specialty labs, There's not a statistically significant difference. The specialty labs, the so-called for-profit labs, report Western blots using CDC criteria statistically significantly similarly to what the reference lab, the university lab, did. So what do we learn from this four-lab study? Well, we learn from this four-lab study that test results from the specialty labs are too nonspecific to rely upon. That's the messaging from your public health authorities. But what they don't tell you is only when using their own in-house interpretive criteria. They don't tell you that the Western blot testing done by the specialty labs using the CDC criteria is as reliable as the university lab. And they don't tell you that the C6 test is a one-tier test outperformed two-tier testing. The National Microbiology Lab looks at, two, at the two-tier testing. Western blots that came from the province of New Brunswick that were sent to the National Microbiology Lab were confirmed 9.8% of the time during the five years between 2011 and 2015. Now this is a test that should have close to a 100% specificity, but our National Microbiology Lab is reporting a 90.2% false positive rate. This is a patient of mine from Calgary who had a negative C6 but positive Western blots. So separating these tests and obliging that you stop testing when a certain test is negative is a faulty structure. Lyme patients are truly sick. This is a study done by um, John Ocott at uh, Hopkins, and he identified that when patients were identified properly using the proper diagnostic techniques and treated properly with full courses of antibiotics early in the course of their disease, that one out of seven patients still had prolonged disability that was identified more than six months after their illness. And this is a study from David Patrick at the University of British Columbia looking at the functional status and impairment of people who have Lyme disease substantiated by the alternative testing, not by the standard testing. These, these panels each have four bars. The bar at the furthest right is the Lyme disease population. I will number them one, two, three in the top row, four, five, six in the second row, and seven in the bottom row. So panel one shows statistically significant uh, reduction in the physical health score for patients with Lyme disease diagnosed with alternative criteria. Uh, this, Number two was a mental health score that didn't show statistically significant difference for the Lyme patients. Box three is the functional capacity score. Lyme patients were statistically significantly below healthy controls. Number four is the Karnofsky scale. This is a quality of life scale. They were substantially significantly below. Yes. Number five is the sleep quality index. They were significantly below. Number six is the fatigue severity scale. They were significantly below. And number seven is the uh, measure of de uh, depression. It's a depressive score. And again, they had more depression. So these patients are profoundly ill and debilitated. But in the 2006 guidelines of the Infectious Diseases Society of America, these patients were described as simply having the consequences of the aches and pains of daily living. Mental health consequences of patients with alternatively diagnosed Lyme disease, one in five of these patients will have suicidal ideation. And 10% of those will actually have suicidal intent. Suicide is the commonest cause of death in the Lyme disease patient population. It's estimated that 1,200 people with Lyme disease diagnosis in the United States die annually by suicide. 
If we use the usual rule that's applied for American data, we can extrapolate and say that that would be in the magnitude of 100 to 120 Canadians dying from uh, suicide. So let's get our bearings. Lyme disease is real. It's frequently a debilitating condition that is spreading geographically. The disease is inadequately recognized clinically and timely treatment is not reliably prescribed. When treated early and correctly, one patient in seven will still have lingering functional impairment. The current testing rationale is specifically designed to protect high diagnostic specificity, and that's at the expense, then, of having poor test sensitivity. As a result, the laboratory testing is too insensitive to allow a provider to rule out Lyme disease when the test is negative. How many patients in this room were told that you did not have Lyme disease because your test was negative? Heck of a lot of hands. Much of the official teaching pertaining to Lyme disease is outdated and factually inaccurate. The Lyme disease patient groups are systematically being marginalized and disability claims due to Lyme disease are systematically not recognized. Legislators in the room, we have a societal problem here. So, I will. I am getting the proverbial hook. <laughs> so my wrap-up will be to allude to evidence-based medicine. Everyone is going to talk to you about the need to practice evidence-based medicine, and David Sackett defined what evidence-based medicine is. It is a coalition of good clinical judgment, the best scientific information, and keeping in consideration patients' preferences and values. And these elements are equal partners. They're equally important, like the three legs of a three-legged stool. What often is purported to be evidence-based medicine is just the pink circle and the yellow circle. The scientific evidence and the clinical judgment of the practitioner being imposed upon the patient. And that is not evidence-based medicine. That is science-based medicine, and it excludes that small little triangle in the center, which is what real evidence-based medicine is. We have to include patients and their perspectives as an important equal partner in all of this. I guess I'm done. I got the hook. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Hawkins. In light of the lime, in light of the time difference, I'd let you go on a little longer there. So, <laughs> especially yeah, given, Westerners can't tell time. <laughs> <laughs> given that you traveled so far to be with us, uh, for sure, wanted to make sure you had the time that you needed to pr give your presentation. But let's go to uh, a few minutes of questions for Dr. Hawkins. In the 2009 guidelines, there were PCR testing in there. Is that restricted to synovial fluid or spinal fluid? And why is that not an accepted test? So PCR testing was included somebody. in the guidelines. Sorry. PCR testing was included in the guidelines, and it was restricted to specific fluids. I can't remember explicitly all of them, but synovial fluid was certainly one. Blood PCR was specifically excluded. Uh, blood PCR testing has very low sensitivity, and I think that might have been the rationale for it. Um, once you have a positive PCR test, you can rely on its specificity. There's a question in the front here. Dr. Webster. Yeah, th thank you very much, Dr. Hawkins. So thanks for mentioning the marginalized populations. New Brunswick already has far too many marginalized populations. And thank you for pointing out the severity of disease associated with, with Lyme disease. These are my family and friends as well. Um, I did want to make a point and ask a question. 
the data that you were alluding to uh, comes from 2008 clinical infectious diseases. So there has been more recent data. There's a you know 2016 more paper which you know, next generation testing. So I, I I think that there's more up to date data. The question I had is around IgG and IgM, which which wasn't referenced. In 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 your patient case where you showed uh, negative uh, EIA C6 EIA, however positive Western blot, I couldn't quite tell because it was covered, but it looked like it was an IgM. So my question is, because there is a big difference, I, w I will frequently see individuals who have been unwell for a long time, 5, 10, 20 years, and they will have an IgM positive, IgG negative, by CDC criteria, by uh, IgenX criteria. What, what's your interpretation of, of that sort of test result? So uh, th that's sort of a two-part comment slash question. So, uh, the um, patient information that I presented was uh, seven weeks after the onset of an acute illness. She had a rash that she saw at home after removing a bug, uh, but the bug was not kept and she did not seek medical attention, so the erythema migrans rash that I presume was there was never uh, documented by a physician. She was admitted to the hospital with a um, with a meningitis and uh, had uh, the testing that I alluded to, a C6 test that was negative at seven weeks. She was told that Lyme disease had been ruled out by her serology. Uh, when I got... Which, which would be wrong, because it's too early. Well, I understand that is, yeah. that is the case, but this is what her infectious diseases consultant told her. But, but the guidelines would also say that that, so, that, that so was... So I would like to continue with the answer rather than the interruptions, please. So uh, what I told her was that we would send her laboratory work to another laboratory, and we sent it to the State University of New York, and those were the results that you saw from the State University of New York. Her IgM had 10 bands positive at seven weeks, and it met CDC criteria by definition, but again, by definition and guideline criteria, because it was measured beyond four weeks, it was not considered to be a positive. By criteria of the guidelines, she had four out of 10 and not five out of 10 IgG blot uh, bands, but she did have a fifth band that was an indeterminate band, not one of the defined bands. So she did not meet the diagnostic criteria by being C6 negative and not having the correct band patterns either because of chronology or the band arrangement. And so she's not counted in Canada as being a Lyme disease patient. But just as your patient with neuromeningitis was treated with intravenous antibiotics for two weeks and got better, so did mine. Your question alluding to patients with late stage Lyme disease, well, Ellen Steer actually wrote an article a number of years ago about the emergence of IgM bands over the course of, the, um, of Lyme disease. And there are late IgM bands that emerge uh, throughout the course of the disease. In the CDC, uh, the CID study that I showed the data very quickly uh, from 2008, the IgM seropositivity, uh, seropositivity was the highest positivity amongst the patients who had late stage Lyme disease. So there does appear in Lyme disease to be emergence of new IgM bands late in the disease. And the reason for that I cannot allude to, but it's an observation that's been made and has been in the literature for two decades. Okay, at this point I'm going to invite Dr. Webster and Dr. Lloyd to come up and join Dr. Hawkins on the panel, and we're going to have a broader discussion and questions. And uh, I would encourage the clinicians in the room to try and, um, like, I don't understand the language you guys are speaking, really. <laughs> French, English, okay, but <laughs> so I know there's lots of clinicians in the room who do understand the discussion that uh, you were just having, but uh, please try and keep it, uh, <laughs> keep it at a level that, uh, that we all can, uh, can comprehend. That would be great. Uh, so uh, questions or comments from the audience? And you can direct them at an individual member or ask for each of them to respond. Thanks. I just wanted to echo what Dr. Webster had said earlier about the more recent studies that have been done that are out there that are randomized double-blind control trials that are the gold standard for evidence-based research. And so, again, I just wanted to echo that 
it would be um, important to look at those and talk about those as well. And um, from a public health perspective, all the provinces in Canada uh, support the two-tiered testing as well as the Public Health Agency of Canada. So across Canada, in terms of the, the support for that testing, that's there and I just wanted to comment on that and, and acknowledge that. So I don't see a question in there, those were two statements, but I'd like to respond if I may. Briefly, please. Yeah, I'll be brief. So the two-tier testing system is faulty and the continuous support and re-endorsement of a faulty system is why we're seeing the problem get worse. So I am a strong advocate for coming up with something that's different. A different approach is needed. And just because everybody else says that it's the right thing to do doesn't make it right. Dr. Weston. Yeah. And, and I would agree that the testing is faulty. All serology is faulty. All serology is flawed. It doesn't matter what disorder we're talking about. There's a lag from the, from the onset of acute illness to positive serology. We see that in, in every, I mean, we could talk about HIV. It's the same thing. So as clinicians, we need to be aware that there's that false negative rate early on in disease. Totally agree. And that's, and that's well recognized. Uh, I, I, would, I wouldn't say that the problem is the flawed testing. I would say the problem is the climate. We're seeing more ticks. That's why we're seeing more, more Lyme disease. Ultimately, that's, that's the problem. So we need, to, we need to address that, and that's why I think climate action is, is really critical. I think that there's got to be increased education, increased awareness as well. Okay, another question? Over here. Hi, I'm Steve Llewellyn from the Daily Gleaner newspaper. I don't understand any of the testing explanation you guys just all gave, but why doesn't the healthcare system just treat people with the antibiotics on suspicion of Lyme disease? Is there something in the treatment that's dangerous that we, we haven't heard about tonight? And, and, and sometimes that's what, what's done and, and should be done. So we always, as, as clinicians, we, we need to recognize the principles of medical ethics. So our first primary ethical duty to each and every patient that we see is to do no harm. And if we don't have a good reason for doing something and it's potentially harmful, then we shouldn't do it. On the other hand, the second principle of medical ethics is do good. So we have to weigh the balances. And if we can see that there's potential benefits in this situation, then we need to consider treating even while we're at this point of diagnostic dilemma, while we try to understand the sensitivity and the specificity of testing, the potential for false negative, the potential for false positive, the differential diagnosis, other things that it may be. So just as a couple examples, in the third case I presented, Lyme disease was on the differential. We treated him. It ultimately was not Lyme disease. And I can tell you about another case recently where a gentleman had uh, onset of, of iritis. He was losing his vision. He also had onset of lo losing his hearing. He lived in a Lyme endemic area. He had ticks in his yard. And those symptoms are consistent with what we see with Lyme disease on occasion. They're not the most common scenarios, but we see it. So Lyme disease was in the differential. Knowing the turnaround time for the test results, I opted to treat this guy as potential Lyme disease. Ultimately, what he had was a reaction to his adalumumab or, or Humira that he was on. That's what it was, and he responded well to steroids. But at the point in time where I had that diagnostic dilemma, in, in trying to do good and balancing that with do no harm, we opted to treat. So sometimes we do, sometimes we do. But when the diagnosis is, is maybe lower on the differential or there's, there, there's time to wait until the test results come back or you've got a broader differential, the medical ethics tell us you're going to do more harm than good potentially, so you, you need not treat. So in some cases we do, but in some cases we really shouldn't. And, and that's always the issue in medicine is trying to balance the harms and good. Because medicines are powerful, and when used in the right setting, they do really tremendous things. But there's always that potential for side effects, and so we need to weigh that very carefully. This, this right here, small. David. This could almost, almost be entitled The Diagnostic Dilemma. The 
ticks are here, the, the disease is here, and there's a diagnostic dilemma. Stephen. Uh, just going on Stephen's question, uh, people have gone down to the United States to get help, and they are getting help from what they're telling me, but yet they can't come here to get that same medication that's helping them. So my question is, why is that? Now, I, maybe you, Dr. Webster, you answered that with what, what you just said, but again, they're getting the help that they need. They feel better, uh, but yet they can't get that medication here in New Brunswick. Why is that? Do you want me to answer? Yeah. It's probably a New Brunswick question. So, yeah, so it's a great question. And uh, so there are people who, who come back from the States requesting ongoing treatment. So people will end up getting treated uh, with a, a cocktail of medications, six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. So I would come back to those five randomized controlled trials that show that extending out treatment is, it, it shows no benefit. So when we compare long courses of treatment to placebo, there's, there's no difference. Now we need to be careful because people are not studies. People are not large populations of, of people. So every single individual you need to look at individually. But let me just paint a potential picture for you, and I, and I would appreciate Dr. Hawkins' uh, perspective on this as well. If I see somebody come back from seeing a clinician in the States and they've received 12 months of treatment and they're saying, I can't afford it anymore, will you prescribe it? And their diagnosis was based, and they've been sick for 20 years, and they're, they're their serology shows a positive IgM and a negative IgG. Coming back to the medical ethics, I, I, can't, I can't in good ethics treat because they don't meet diagnostic criteria for Lyme disease and there's probably benefits to making sure there's not something else causing that. So we need to look and make sure there's not something else causing it. But that's often what I see. Positive IgM with an illness for 20 years, IgG negative. Thank you. So uh, just to answer that specific patient type, I see those types of patients who come back from the United States after nearly bankrupting themselves, triple mortgaging their houses, etc. And I see the same scenario where they've been sick for 20 years, they've been going to an expensive clinic, they have uh, received all of the treatment that they can afford, they come back, they have the positive IgM as Dr. Webster alludes to, and uh, negative serologic criteria. Uh, what I do in those situations is I don't treat them either unless they have evidence of active disease. I accept as evidence of active disease a T cell test that's called ELI spot. This is a test that's done in Europe, it's done in the United States, it's not a test that has been vetted yet by Health Canada, no pun intended. Uh, it's not been looked at yet by Health Canada, and so it doesn't have Health Canada approval. But that doesn't make it a bad test. Looks at T cell activity directed towards infections, and you can actually treat infections with high LE spot results with some confidence that you're treating something that's real. So in the scenario that Dr. Webster alludes to, I would get that further data to see if there's a legitimate reason to believe that Lyme disease is active or not. And if, in most cases, after 12 months of antibiotics, the ELI spots are negative, then I will also pursue a different alternative uh, diagnosis rather than tick-borne disease, because I think tick-borne disease is not a likely diagnosis in that scenario at that point. I'm not going to be commenting on patient treatment, obviously. Um, I'll stick to the science. Um, and there are two points I want to touch on. One is the studies of long-term antibiotic treatment. And it's important to note that there's a lot of nuances in those five studies. And of those five studies, three actually did show improvement with long-term treatment. Uh, they were modest improvements, but then long-term treatment was actually quite a short-term duration. So those studies have to be looked at very carefully and looked at carefully in the context of are the, what's happening in those studies. Is that what patients are getting in the States? The other situation is because I've been doing a number of studies uh, in conjunction with the Lyme disease community in New Brunswick looking at, and across Canada actually, looking at the number of patients who are getting treated in the United States 
and something that we really need to do rather than just throwing either artificial scenarios around or saying everyone treated in the States is bad, evil, non-Canadian, non-patriotic, and being deluded, is actually look at the outcomes of the different treatment modalities. Let's get some data rather than just assuming what's happening or making artificial scenarios. Because I know that there are likely a number of people in this room who have, in fact, recovered their health by being treated in the States. So let's see if we can do that in Canada. I absolutely agree. I mean, there's, there's always, it's always good to get more data. And, and coming back to the concept of the complex chronic disease clinic, I think one of the things that is very challenging for us locally is our, the way our healthcare system works is, you know, being shipped off often to different specialists. And for certain things, that works really well. I mean, if you have a broken hip, you can ship off to your orthopedic surgeon. Awesome. But when you have a complex chronic disease, and it's got some neurologic components, some rheumatologic components, some infectious disease components, some endocrine components, and you get bounced around and you see one, one uh, specialist and he says, well, I'm gonna refer you to another, you go on a wait list. You know, eight months later, you get seen by that next specialist. There's more things going on. Well, now let's send you to the neurologist. Another five months passes. The, the care becomes really disjointed and it's frustrating and it doesn't, no, nobody wins. And what's gonna be benefit New Brunswick is healthy New Brunswickers. So for people with complex chronic diseases, which Lyme disease often falls into that category, to have a different model of care I think is really critical. And I absolutely agree with what Dr. Lloyd is saying, to look at outcomes, because some people do do well with longer antibiotics. So again, people, individual people are not studies. So that's why you need to have those studies, you need to rely on them to guide decisions but just as this, this Venn diagram shows, you absolutely need to have the patient involved in management decisions as well. We have to, as clinicians, we have to listen, we have to empathize, and we have to apply that as well. And if we had a complex chronic disease clinic that had a model of care that was multidisciplinary, could advocate for fast tracking to specialists, could do well to, to even, even like the Mayo Clinic, to bring specialists together on the same day to see a patient concurrently, like wow, how great would that be? but to have another model and also be tracking outcomes so that we can understand better what's going on. So I, I absolutely agree, Dr. Lloyd. Thank you. I can take one last question. Uh, Chris Austin. Uh, this was a great presentation by all three of you. Uh, very much appreciate the information. Um, you've got a few MLAs here. Uh, myself included. Um, I'm curious, I guess, directed at Dr. Hawkins, um, being from um, Calgary, is there a province out there that has legislation that directly affects Lyme disease treatment? And are we lacking that here? And what can we do as legislators uh, to uh, either raise awareness or, or make some changes to, to how its uh, health care is delivered as it relates to Lyme disease? No. <laughs> what I'd look for is I'd look for you to be leaders. You've got a great opportunity in this province to actually lead the charge. You've got an emerging Lyme disease problem. And you've got regions in this province that are not yet affected, so that gives you an opportunity to look at how to prevent the endemic spread of the disease. You've also got an endemic population where there's higher levels of people getting sick, which gives you the opportunity to look at treatment. But you, as leaders, need to be innovative. And quite frankly, as people who elect you, we look to you to lead. Thank you for that. So thank you to the panelists. You can stay here if you'd like, or you can go back to the floor, whatever you prefer. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Janet Higgins to come up now. So uh, you don't want to stand in. Yeah, it's, it's nice. Uh, so Janet Higgins is the founding president of the New Brunswick Lyme Disease Association. 
uh, a charitable organization and not for profit, whose message is preventing tick-borne illness while supporting and being a voice for those affected. LIMNB was incorporated in 2016 and as such is still a relatively young organization. Janet is a retired civil servant, having worked in government for over 35 years, uh, most recently as Assistant Deputy Minister of the former Department of Natural Resources. You broke it when you left, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Janet brings to her role present the skills she has acquired over the years. She works with her counterparts across the country, as well as local decision makers, in an effort to bring about change in the way which Lyme disease is diagnosed and treated. In New Brunswick, I thought I edited this down, but I, apparently I didn't. There's good stuff in here yet to come. Um, so uh, Janet and Lyme New Brunswick are involved in two major projects. One is a collection of patient stories, which uh, is going to be available under the title of Faces of Lyme in New Brunswick, Le Lyme et ses visages au Nouveau-Brunswick. And the second is a pan-Canadian study in collaboration with Mount Allison uh, to establish a patient data bank to inform and accelerate research and public policy. So, Janet, please. So good evening. Je suis très heureuse de participer à cette table ronde et de représenter Lyme NB. As David said, Lyme NB undertook three major projects this year. The first is tonight's roundtable. And we are very grateful that David Kuhn and his staff have helped bring this project to life. Our gratitude also goes to the presenters, to you, the guests, and to the 40-some-odd observers who have traveled from all around the province, from all corners of the province. Our second project is what you see on the screen, the collection of patient stories, Faces of Lyme in New Brunswick, Le Lyme et ses visages au Nouveau Brunswick. This collection, I hope you all got a copy, this collection is a tribute to the people who have suffered and continue to suffer from this devastating disease, Lyme. Cette collection est un hommage aux gens qui ont souffert et qui continuent à souffrir de la maladie de Lyme. These stories that are in this book, booklet, are about real people. They are not statistics nor are they medical files. They are parents, children, spouses, friends, neighbors, who are in pain and suffering, who have been misunderstood and disbelieved, who have lost their quality of life and often their livelihood. Each story describes a disease that has had a profound personal impact. So tonight, we are privileged to hear from three of the contributors to this collection. Not in order of where they're sitting, but Chloe in the middle, and Chuck beside her, and Kathy on my far right. I thank them in advance for agreeing to share their journey. Je les remercie à l'avance d'avoir accepté de nous faire part de leur parcours. So this is the order. Chloe's number one. Then it's the man in the middle. And then we'll, we'll wrap up with Kathy. Chloe. My goodness, I'm so nervous. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chloe Colley. I'm 13 years old. I was diagnosed with Lyme disease two years ago. It all started the day before Easter, and I had just come back from my dad's. We'd been out in the woods behind his house two days before. My dad dropped me off at my grandma's, and I went to an Easter party. After the party, I started to notice a bad pain in my lower stomach, so I told my mom. She figured I'd just eaten too much chocolate. 
The next day, it got worse. She thought I may have gotten the stomach bug that everyone seemed to have because I had a mild fever too. The days went on and my pain kept getting worse, spreading to my back. Three weeks had passed, my mom got worried. We had our first trip to the emergency room. We ended up sitting there for over five hours just to have a doctor tell me that I had gastritis and give me a prescription for a prevacid. I was bit by a tick we never found because who looks for a tick when it's basically winter outside? That day in the woods, I was wearing a snowsuit and a hat. I didn't have a bullseye rash. The next two years zoomed by, seeing doctor after doctor, family doctor, clinic doctor, three emergency room doctors, a pediatrician, three gastroenterologists, just so you know, that's a stomach doctor, <laughs> one infectious disease specialist, one rheumatologist, and three naturopaths. Doctor after doctor told me it was all in my head. I lost 26 pounds in a couple of months. One specialist even told my mom I needed to see a psychiatrist because he figured I'd lost all that weight by puking up my food. Another specialist thought that I just needed better footwear and that would fix all my joint pain. One of the first pediatricians told me I had H. pylori, classic H. pylori. Then I was told I must have Crohn's. It, never, it just never stopped. I had gastric scopes done at the, ch at the Children's Hospital in Halifax. Yep, no Crohn's. None of the doctors would even talk about Lyme and said my tests weren't reliable, even though my parents had paid for Igenex testing. The result was a positive for Lyme. No one would even consider the ca ca Canadian test because they didn't feel my symptoms were Lyme symptoms. Only natural paths would agree that I had Lyme and that I also had Bartonella and Babiosis, nature's dirty needle. My parents paid for everything out of pocket. My mom even drove me all the way to Ottawa to see a natural path that specializes in Lyme. I started herbal treatments, but nothing was helping. My pain kept spreading to my joints, so we started with antibiotics. This was nine months after the tick bite, and I, was, I think it was too late. There really wasn't a lot of other things we could try. Lucky for me, I have a therapist who helped me learn mindfulness, which I am now very good at. I could teach a class of adults how to do it. My therapist also helps me with different emotions and how to deal with them. Every day is hard, though. Even, the best, even with the best skills, I started feeling angry with the healthcare system and angry with my disease. At the same time, I was proud of myself for learning to listen to my body and learning to have a voice. Last year was really rough. I only could muster the energy to go to school for two classes a day. My mom struggled to, get, struggled to get me out of bed, but she pushed me because she was afraid if I didn't get up, I would be bedridden. I felt anxious all the time and was in so much pain, but I wanted to be a normal kid. I felt lonely because no one at school understood. I felt sad and depressed because I can't do a lot of things I used to. Getting up in the morning is still a struggle every day. Can you imagine being 13 and being so stiff in the morning you can't even move? Hopeful and hopeless go hand in hand most days. There's happiness in knowing your friends are there. The ones that stay, the there, there is happiness in knowing your friends are there. The ones who stay by you when you're so sick and too tired to play. I've even met new friends who are willing to stand by me. On the really bad days, I get sad and impatient, wondering if I'll ever feel normal again. Will I ever feel, be pain free? Will I ever sleep again or be able to focus? Is this my life? I was in shock to know that this was happening to others across Canada and nobody was doing anything about it. I remember thinking, if I had the choice to give someone else my pain and be pain free, I wouldn't because no one in this world deserves to feel what I'm going through. Now, I don't need you to feel bad for me. I need you to help me. You talk about making this world a better place for your kids. Start by telling kids it's not in their head when it's not. Just because you can't see the pain doesn't mean it's not real. Thank you. That'll be a hard act to follow. <laughs> I'll start with a few words about myself. Uh, my wife, Anne, sitting up front here. 
and I raised two very active boys in Hampton. Um, we, uh, we did many outdoor activities, including golf, cycling, uh, camping, and hiking. My wife has worked for Horizon Health uh, ever since she graduated from nursing. And uh, I've been president, or I am president of a longstanding St. John company, TS Sims & Co. Uh, and I've been with Sims for 36 years. So, and, I, and I'm not the type of person to go visit my doctor on a regular basis or, or be absent from work uh, for any, any length of time until this disease really turned my life upside down. My symptoms included chronic headaches, chronic neck and shoulder pain, uh, sore ankles, difficulty walking, uh, probably like an unhealthy 80-year-old at times, uh, swollen, unrecognizable ankles, night sweats, I'd wake up during the night with numbness in my nose, on my nose, uh, sleep apnea, tinnitus, overwhelming tiredness and difficulty concentrating, insomnia, and a general feeling of being unwell. Um, I've tried, I've been treated by a physio, chiropractor, massage therapy, even tried craniosacral therapy. Uh, with little or no relief. And during an intense five months period in 2016, I seen my, uh, my family physician over a dozen times, went to the ER, ER uh, was seen by a rheumatologist, had many rounds of blood work, including two Canadian Lyme tests and uh, one US IgenX uh, Lyme test, various x-rays, Doppler ultrasound to rule out blood clots, for my swollen ankles. Uh, I attempted to see an infectious disease specialist only to find out that the wait was over a year. So we started researching Lyme and found out that I had many of the symptoms. Scheduled yet another appointment with my family physician uh, to discuss Lyme. My doctor was very skeptical, didn't think that I had been uh, exposed to a Lyme infected ticks and I did not have a, a bullseye rash. Uh, during 2016, my relationship with my family physician uh, grew more and more adversarial. At one point, I received a four-week uh, course of doxycycline uh, and felt much better than I had in many months. During my next appointment, he said that I definitely did not have Lyme. In fact, I never had Lyme. And even, even if I did, uh, he cured me with the uh, four weeks of antibiotics. He explained to me that I was feeling better on antibiotics due to the uh, placebo effect. Translation was all in my head. Next, he warned me. He said not to go down to the US and get myself labeled with chronic Lyme. I asked him what he could offer, and he told me that sometimes it takes years before an illness can develop to the point where uh, he can diagnose it. It could be lupus, it could be fibromyalgia, or something else. It would just take time to figure it out. Basically, he was suggesting that I go home and, let, and wait a couple of years to let the, the disease take a better hold of me, as if, as if it hadn't already. And uh, where am I at here? Oh, and, and so he could diagnose it. He said, but, but the thing that kept ringing in my head was, but don't go down to the US and, and get yourself labeled with Lyme. It became apparent to my wife and I my nurse, caregiver, um, that Lyme was the number one suspect. We booked an appointment with, with the uh, US Lyme literate MD. Now at this point in the progression of my illness, I can barely carry on the conversation. I'm so tired that I can't get up at a regular time in the morning, and when I do, I'm already exhausted. I could only tolerate being in the office for a couple of hours. I'd read a couple of emails, uh, try to act normal, but I couldn't. I would finally give in, head back home, go to bed, stay in bed all afternoon, get up, eat, go lie down before going to bed for the night. And all of this would repeat itself the next day. I, honestly, I felt like I was dying. I thought this was it. On June 24th, 2016, I, we had the uh, first appointment with my Lyme literate MD, Dr. Dubach in Maine, which many of you know. Uh, he reviewed my US IgenX lab test results 
and along with his clinical findings, diagnosed me with chronic Lyme, late, late stage Lyme. He has been treating me ever since with antibiotics, vitamins, supplements. I feel much better today than, and my energy is, is level is good. I can work and I can function in society. <laughs> I, I can't help but wonder what, my, what would be left of my life had I listened to my family physician and not looked uh, for help outside of Canada. The Canadian medical system does not recognize chronic Lyme and denies treatment to chronic Lyme patients, letting us suffer. To add insult to injury, if you seek treatment in the US, you risk alienating or losing your Canadian doctor. Chronic Lyme can impact any one of us. If you are lucky and can afford treatment outside of Canada, you may only have to put, up, put your life on hold for a couple of years. If not, you risk losing everything that is worth living for. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Smith. In December 1999, I had a wonderful hike in Fundy Park, but little did I know that that hike would change my life forever. I saw a funny rash on my back after the hike that looked somewhat like ringworm, and typical nurse, I decided that if it was still there in a week or so, I would go to the doctor. But when I looked again, it was gone. As the year 2000 rang in, I started having very strange symptoms. I would wake up very early in the morning, like four or five o'clock, felt increasingly irritable, which was not my personality at all. In July, I was diagnosed as being profoundly hypothyroid and had H. pylori. I also began having a strange nausea, which I could only describe as being in the back of my throat constantly and not like the type of nausea that you would have to vomit. When the specialist put me on antibiotics for H. pylori, I felt much better. But when they were done, I felt worse again. I was diagnosed with possible Whipple's disease and given IV ceftriaxone and IM streptomycin for two weeks. I felt 100% better after eight days of treatment. It was then I noticed I was having head pressure because it was gone and I realized, you know, it was, it was so much better. Sorry, I double spaced now, I can't turn the page. The improvement lasted much longer before the symptoms were back again. So I asked the specialist to try again, but I could tell he was reluctant to continue. So I requested a consult to the Leahy Clinic in Boston. There I saw an infectious disease doctor who did mention Lyme disease, but said it was far overdiagnosed, so he sent me to a gastroenterologist who felt that the nausea that I was having was a type of motion sickness. By this time, I had lost about 75 pounds. He told me to take an over-the-counter drug um, called Bonine, which did really help that. But then strange symptoms began to increase. With confusion, I was getting lost driving around Moncton, which I knew very well. The head pressure increased. I had numbness in my face, hands, feet, twitches in my face, and petty mal seizures, mostly at night. I, saw, I finally saw a neurologist who agreed to do an LP. And this showed a bacteria in my spinal fluid, but they were looking for Whipple's disease so the bacteria was not identified. He mentioned Lyme disease, so this was the third time that I heard Lyme disease, so I thought I would look it up. Well, when I saw the symptom list, along with the very rash that was in the middle of my back, I knew this was it. So I mentioned it to my family doctor, who discounted it and admitted me, unbeknownst to me, to the hospital for psychiatric evaluation. And that helped without, that happened without me being, knowing about it. He convinced my husband and immediate family I was mentally ill. 
I'm a very sensitive person, so I could feel everybody withdrawing their support. Friends, co-workers, family. My husband finally did leave. By this point, I had seen over 20 specialists, had numerous tests, including MRIs, one that did mention Lyme disease as a possible diagnosis as the white spots associated with Lyme disease were seen. CTs, x-rays, blood work, endoscopies, ECGs, LP, colonoscopy. Emotionally, this is, experience has taken its toll on me. I cannot trust anyone, especially physicians and even family. This is a very lonely disease. I remember the phone call with Dr. Murakami in BC who confirmed my suspicion of Lyme disease and co-infections. I sobbed and cried with relief, but little did I know the years of suffering I would have to endure with no help from the Canadian medical professionals. I had no energy, so I traveled to California to have another controversial treatment done, CCSVI treatment. Thankfully, this restored my energy. I had lost the two physicians who were willing to help me in Canada due to the pressures from their governing bodies resulting in them losing their practices. So I had to travel to Maine. My, it was my only option in my mind was to go to the States for help. I traveled to Maine where the, the physician spent well over an hour with me going over my symptoms and treatment options. I was diagnosed with Lyme, Babesia, and Bartonella, which I knew from Dr. Murakami. That's what I had. Um, and after many months of antibiotics, uh, I am a lot better, not 100%. I have joint issues and uh, neurological issues, but the nausea is gone. Thank goodness. Um, this disease has become a human rights issue. I only have the money for one more trip to the States. The financial cost of not recognizing and treating chronic Lyme disease in Canada is astronomical. When you consider the number of specialists, the number of tests, it's astronomical. Um, I am only one of thousands across Canada who have been misdiagnosed and have seen over 20 specialists and have gone through numerous expensive testing. Ultimately, the infectious disease specialists need to recognize that the guidelines are faulty. Only then will we get the help that we so desperately need. It never ceases to amaze me, and I'm not blaming, I'm just, I want you to understand. It never ceases to amaze me how they can say we do not have chronic Lyme disease when they have never looked after someone with it. I have been very traumatized through this journey and do not want anyone else to go through this nightmare. And my heart breaks for the children that I know are going to get bit bitten this summer. This is a pandemic and our government had better address it. My name is Kathy Smith. I worked in healthcare as an LPN for over 45 years. I have loved my job, rarely took a sick day before being bitten. I am shocked and disillusioned by the lack of care and concern of those of us with Lyme disease. Thank you. So thank you very much to our three contributors, to our Faces of Lyme. It isn't easy to tell your story, but we're so glad that you took the, that you were able to do that. And I'm sure that Chloe's parents are very proud of her. Okay, so the third project I was going to, I want to talk about tonight is the Canadian Lyme Scape Survey. Oh, I have to click, yes, that's right. Let's get with the program here. Great. The Canadian Lyme Survey. This is a survey that was developed 
in partnership with Mount Allison University. Thank you very much, Mount Allison University. And was first rolled out in New Brunswick over, over a period of six to seven weeks this winter. It's a big data project, and it covers topics ranging from encounters with ticks to impact on quality of life. So what are the preliminary results tell us about the patient experience in New Brunswick? Qu'est-ce que les résultats préliminaires nous révèlent sur l'expérience des patients au New Brunswick? So I want to start by talking about the rash, which we've heard about tonight. When people hear about Lyme disease, they often think about the bullseye rash. And yet many people do not get a rash. And of those who do, only a small percentage get a bullseye rash. But one thing is certain, and we heard that tonight, when people have a red expanding rash, with a center clearing or not, they have been infected with Lyme disease. The diagnosis is straightforward, and treatment can begin immediately. So let's look at our data. More than three quarters of respondents who presented with the telltale rash were not being diagnosed, were not diagnosed, excuse me, with Lyme disease. Actually, I need a Kleenex. Has somebody got one close at hand? <laughs> or if you could bring me my purse. Thank you. I'll use a cloth one, yes. Thank you. Just in case, or whoever else. Napkins, that's pretty good. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Uh, more than three quarters of respondents who presented with a telltale rash were not being diagnosed with Lyme based on the presence of the rash. As early diagnosis, as we've heard tonight, is key to successful recovery from Lyme disease, any delay in diagnosis is of consequence to patients. Patients who are not treated immediately based on the rash are being shortchanged, and their health is being compromised. In many cases, a significant amount of time goes on, goes by, before an accurate diagnosis is made. In some cases, as many as 15 years can go by. This has serious consequences and truly compromises their chances for recovery. Dans plusieurs cas, le temps entre l'apparition des, des symptômes et l'obtention du bon diagnostic est très long. En fait, jusqu'à 15 ans peuvent passer avant de voir le bon diagnostic. You will note that only a small number of the respondents reported being treated within a month. So why does it take so long to get a diagnosis? That is a good question to ask. Well, according to the data, many patients see more than one doctor on their way to being diagnosed. Some see more than five doctors, and we've heard about that from our patient, patient presenters. Others more than 10 doctors. So think of the time spent waiting for the next referral. Think of the infections spreading and taking hold in the patient's body during this time. Think of the cost to our healthcare system. Well, why is this happening, you might ask? Well, there could be several explanations, and I'll, just one of them comes to mind. Diagnosing the disease is not easy or straightforward. Some, as a matter of fact, it gets harder and harder as time goes by. Often called the great imitator, Lyme disease has symptoms that overlap with those of many other illnesses. And I think we've heard that mentioned earlier this evening. This makes it difficult to determine the underlying cause of the presenting symptoms. A more fundamental question to ask, however, is this acceptable when the results of these delays is so devastating for patients and so costly to our healthcare system? This slide shows, and you probably can't read it from the back, maybe even not from the front, the multitude of diagnosis that patients can receive as they move from one doctor to the next. So, regardez, regardez la multitude de diagnostics que les répondants ont reçus en cours de route. 
Please note that the most frequent diagnoses have to do with the mental state of the patient. The data confirms what we often hear. Patients are being told, it's in your head, it's not real. The last referral for many is to a psychiatrist. And it's at this point that patients give up on the care that's available to them at home and begin to seek diagnosis and treatment elsewhere. C'est souvent à ce moment-là que les patients décident d'aller ailleurs pour le diagnostic et le traitement. So by the time patients are diagnosed, according to our data, the disease is pretty much established in the body and it's then described as late stage untreated Lyme. These patients already have had neurological, cardiovascular, or musculoskeletal symptoms for more than six months. These patients are not going to be helped by the standard short course of antibiotics. Interestingly, the data also shows that a certain number of patients remain ill for at least six months after treatment with antibiotics, a fact that points to the persistence of infection. And the fact that infection can persist after treatment is supported by the research, showing that a percentage of per patients between 10 and 20 percent can and continue to suffer from persistent infection following treatment. So what about the impact on a patient's personal life? Well, for many, being sick has taken a significant toll on their personal lives, and in some cases for more than five years. You have heard the patient presenters speak to this, and you will see the impact in virtually all the stories in the faces of Lyme Connection. Prenez le temps de lire les témoignages dans la collection. Vous verrez tout de suite l'impact qu'a cette maladie. Another big impact is the cost of treatment. As care is not readily available in New Brunswick, patients are going out of province, out of country, even to other continents for treatment. This takes money, in some cases, a lot of money. And these costs are all out of pocket. By way of example, this week I received a video story from a young mother of small children who has sought care over the past six years in Calgary, New York, and Europe after seeing countless specialists here in New Brunswick. This young person told me that she has incurred a debt of close to $400,000 to date. Some of the costs are related to testing, which you can see on this slide, and some spend less than 100, but some spend more than 1,000. And none of these costs is part of your regular budget, your everyday budget. Here are some costs about visits to the doctor. Some spend anywhere between 2,500 and 5,000, but some spend even more. So when asked about the three worst aspects of being sick, many cited fatigue as being one of the worst aspects of being sick. And it is a crushing fatigue that Lyme patients suffer from, the kind that leaves you stuck in bed or on the couch or exhausted by the simple, ta simple task of taking a shower or even getting dressed. La fatigue pose un très grand défi pour bien des patients. Il s'agit d'une fatigue écrasante qui empêche de se lever du lit ou du divan et qui laisse quelqu'un épuisé par le simple fait de prendre une douche ou même de s'habiller. Others cited, others noted the pain associated with Lyme disease, while others noted the, cited the difficulty of leading a normal life. But there were a good number who cited the lack of acknowledgement from the medical community. And this is something we heard tonight and we often hear physicians refusing to acknowledge that ticks and Lyme disease and their disease exist in their region. Physicians taking negative results, test results at face value. Physicians denying positive results. Physicians not considering test results from elsewhere. 
physicians simply not believing patients and suggesting that it's all in their heads. Physicians refusing to treat for fear of being sanctioned by the College of Physicians and Surgeons. And yet there is a bit of a silver lining in all of this dark, dark cloud. There have been gains. And many people said in the, in the survey indicated that the illness had afforded them a new appreciation for the ordinary things in life. Some have developed a, developed a greater self-awareness and some have taken on a new direction in their personal lives. So how do patients view their health at the time of recovery, at the time of the survey? Well, overall, the majority of patients reported they were getting better, which is a good news, which is good news. Some indicated that their health had been almost completely restored. A few, complete, a few, uh, all, a few completely restored. Many acknowledged that they'd had a, they have a long road ahead, and unfortunately, a few felt that they, they could not seem to get better. So what have we learned about the patient experience tonight? We've learned that patients are not being diagnosed soon enough. They're being shunted from one physician to the next. They're not being believed. They're being misdiagnosed and treated for the wrong disease. They're being obliged to seek treatment elsewhere. They're being obliged to pay out of pocket for their health care. They're getting better, some completely better, and others still struggling. So I leave you tonight with two questions, two serious questions. What can we do better to support the current patient population? What can we do to ensure that the next generation does not experience the same hardships? Thank you. Okay, David just asked me, because some people might be asking where the survey might be available. Uh, <clears throat> right now, it's not posted anywhere. It was uh, advertised many, many times on Facebook. And certainly my partner, Dr. Vet Lloyd, can certainly speak to that question. Okay, so we absolutely welcome people contributing their experience. It, it's sharing that experience is, is a very wonderful, generous thing to do. We're in the process of transitioning it from a paper format, which was heavy, expensive, long, painful, to a electronic, basically an online form format. Uh, the trick is we have to do it in a secure way so no one gets in and steals your medical information or anything else you could share, share with us. So I have been learning to code. It's really, really fun. Um, shortly after I discovered that I'm too old to learn to do this, I gave it to a 20-year-old who looked at me painfully and said, Dr. Lloyd, this is so easy. <laughs> so we will be expanding this across Canada in a graded sense, but we'll be reopening it in about a month right after my 20-year-old uh, learns how to use a comma. I can do that at least. <laughs> Thank you, my colleagues. I will say... Um, I want to make this sound right. So MLAs um, often have multiple demands on their times, and cabinet ministers and leaders even more so, in terms of having to be in one, many places at one time. And uh, I want to say personal thanks to my colleagues, to the ministers, to the MLAs here, who have taken the time to spend this evening with us, spent the entire evening with us, um, and, uh, and did whatever they did to have to make room on their schedules to be here. So I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. And of course, I know that's the case for others as well. So thank you for doing that and being here. Um, but, uh, but I, I mean, I, I share, live this experience with, uh, with my colleagues here in terms of our scheduling, so, uh, so I do appreciate it. So uh, thanks again and uh, have a great evening.